When we left off a week ago, I had gotten not quite one page into section three. With a little luck, we'll get a little further than that into section four before we're done today. But just to summarize again, after looking at electrostatics for a couple of weeks, static meaning things at rest, now we're going to let the electric charges move around. So if you establish an electric field inside of, for example, a piece of wire, the electric field in this case that I sketched out here, the electric field comes from a battery. Any free charges inside that wire, which a metal has lots of free charges in it, electrons in that case, these, these charges that are free to move around get pushed on by the electric field and therefore begin to flow. And this flow is called an electric current. The rate of flow is what this thing represented by the letter, of, letter I stands for. How much charge flows past a given point per unit time. And I talked a little bit about the difference between electron flow and conventional positive current. Conventional current flows from plus to minus because it's defined with positive charge in mind. Electrons, of course, being negative, go the other way. And we will pretty much, well, at least for the most part, maybe pretty much entirely, talk about conventional current in this course. You do occasionally see books that are written in, you know, textbooks that are written in terms of electron flow rather than conventional positive current. Um, they tend to be books written for, you know, electronic technician type people, the guys with the soldering irons and screwdrivers. I've never seen a physics book that was written that way because if you go on deeper into the subject, it turns all the math around backwards if you're doing everything with negative charges in mind. Anyhow, that gets us down to where it says electrical resistance. So if you have, for example, a light bulb, well, there's lots of kinds of light bulbs these days. Um, myself, I've got a whole box of incandescent light bulbs in my basement because that's where I put them when I took them out and replaced them with the more efficient modern types. The ones I replaced a few years ago, I put in compact fluorescence. Any I replaced in the last year or so, it's the, the LEDs, but I can tell you how they work if you really wanna know. But look, for the moment, let's talk about an old fashioned light bulb of the type, well, more or less of the type invented by Thomas Edison, okay? The purpose of the glass bulb is to protect the filament from oxygen. If you've ever like knocked a lamp over when you were vacuuming or something like that, if it was on, maybe you noticed what happens is that after the glass breaks, for a fraction of a second, the light is really, really, really bright. And then it goes out because uh, all there is to a, a, a light bulb is there's a piece of wire and you shove enough electric current through it to get it really hot. They make them out of tungsten because tungsten has a ridiculously high melting point. You can get it white hot without it melting, but if you expose it to oxygen, it, it basically burns up, it oxidizes. So anyhow, whether, whether it's a light bulb or the heating element in a toaster or a space heater or any of those things, they're all examples of resistors. They resist the flow of electric current because as the electrons flow through this piece of wire, the light bulb filament, well, you know, it's not just empty space in there. It's a solid piece of metal they're going through. And there's metal atoms all around that they keep bumping into. So if you watched one particular electron, for a little while, if you have like really good eyes, that electron will be going faster and faster and faster because of the electric field pushing on it makes it accelerate. 
but before it's gone hardly any distance at all, smacks into a metal atom. And in the collision, the electron typically loses energy, which is transferred to the thing it ran into, leaving it vibrating with a higher amplitude. You know, before the collision, the atom is vibrating like that. The jolt from the collision means it's vibrating like that. Afterward, more kinetic energy per metal atom, it's a higher temperature. You've, you've raised the temperature by increasing the molecular motion. But anyhow, the, uh, the electron bounces off, the electric field is still pushing on it, it starts picking up speed again, runs into another atom, and the process repeats over and over, and all the other electrons around it are going through the same kind of thing. So in this way, the energy of the flowing electrons is transferred to the surrounding material, raising its temperature. Okay, the, the material is said to resist the flow of electricity. It's really, you know, if, if you want to make analogies between electricity and some kind of a mechanical system, resistance is to electricity what friction is in mechanics, okay? If I had a book sitting on the floor and I kicked it, well, once, once it comes off my foot, you've got a book with a certain amount of kinetic energy sliding across the floor. As time passes, it goes slower and slower because friction is converting the kinetic energy that the book used to have into heat. Well, the energy of the moving electrons gets converted into heat by electrical resistance. So that's, uh, that's what's going on at the fundamental level, the molecular level. The amount of resistance that something has is defined by a relationship called Ohm's law. Whether it's a light bulb or whether it's one of those little resistors that you see soldered to a circuit board, if you look in some electronic device, the potential difference across the resistor is proportional to the current flowing through the resistor. Twice the voltage will shove twice as many amps through there. The proportionality constant between them is called the resistance of the resistor. Uh, the resistance depends on a couple of factors, one of which is what material the resistor is made out of. If you have a chunk of graphite, the resistance is going to be higher than if you have a chunk of silver, all else being equal, same diameter, same length, and so on. But uh, if all else is not equal, a longer wire has more resistance than a shorter wire, and a thinner wire has more resistance than a fat one. So as I've already probably said once or twice, analogies can be useful things. Electricity is kind of intangible and invisible, and think of it, it's often useful to think of it as being just like water flowing through a pipe. So a battery is to a circuit, what a pump is to a plumbing system. It, pump makes the water go through the pipes, battery makes the electricity go through the wires. The voltage, the potential difference from your battery or power supply or whatever you're using, you could compare that to the pressure from the pump, okay? If you've got a pump in your basement, you know, pumping water out of the well, if that thing is putting out 40 pounds per square inch, it's pushing twice as hard down the water as if it was only creating 20 pounds per square inch. And in a kind of sort of analogous way, if you have uh, a 12 volt battery, it's pushing twice as hard on the electrons inside the wires as if you had a six volt battery, okay? So voltage is kind of like the pressure that you're getting from the pump or in the case of a resistor, how much pressure is lost as the 
as the water flows through the, the resistor. Current, I think I already said this last time, current measured in amps, the, the, the amps are the rate of flow, how many coulombs per second flowing through a pipe or flowing through a wire compared to how many gallons per second flowing through a pipe. Resistance involves factors like how big around the pipe is. If you've got some little capillary tube, you're not going to be able to push three gallons per minute through that, at least not without an awful lot of pressure that'll probably blow up your capillary tube. But you know, if you've got a like a three inch pipe, that's another matter entirely. So you can push more gallons per second through a fatter pipe. You can push more coulombs per second through a fatter wire. So that's uh, hopefully a helpful way to think of it. Well, here's a problem with some numbers in it. You've got a circuit with a couple of batteries and a couple of resistors, the, the little jagged broken line looking things are resistors because I didn't feel like drawing pictures of, you know, like a lamp sitting on an end table or something like that. But uh, you know the voltage and resistance for the ones on the right hand side of the picture. Uh, it wasn't nice enough to tell you what's on the left hand side of the picture. The question is to find the potential, the voltage in other words relative to the ground. When, when a circuit is grounded, you normally take ground potential to be zero. Ground, by the way, in connection with a circuit, basically means the same thing that ground does to a farmer. It's that ground crumbly stuff that the grass is growing in out there. If you follow, you know, you got a three prong plug here. If you follow the ground wire from that outlet, where you eventually end up is at a long stake that's been driven down into the ground far enough that it gets down to where the ground is always kind of damp. And see, the earth can be used as a huge reservoir of electric charge. You can suck charge out of it, you can dump charge into it. And uh, why you would want to connect to that, well, maybe I'll save that, that story for a little later. I think I get to that later today, actually. But um, this symbol for a ground actually is not one I put on your formula sheet, because I think that picture right there is the only point in the whole course where I use it. But when, when, uh, when, when a certain point in a circuit is connected to ground, you think of that point as being where B equals zero. So relative to that point, what is the potential at point A? What is the potential at point B? And from things that were on the previous page, you should be able to figure that out. But if not, I'll be telling you in a few minutes. I'm gonna go over just part A now, because at this point, people either have the right answer or need it explained to them one or the other. The answer to part A is negative nine volts. And that doesn't have anything to do with Ohm's law. You need Ohm's law to do part B, but part A is just a matter of noticing that there is a nine volt battery between point A and the point that we're defining to have a potential of zero. So that means point A is either nine volts above or nine volts below ground, one or the other. To choose between those, you have to remember what I mentioned on the first page, which is that the, uh, the longer side of the battery symbol is the positive terminal and the short side is the negative terminal, or to put it in a way that maybe is more useful, the bigger side of the symbol is where you have the bigger voltage. So if A is connected to the lower voltage side of the battery, that means it's nine volts lower than ground potential, negative nine. And I'll write that down, but that's what I'm gonna write down.
So one more time, if this point is at zero, and then you've got this battery, this is the high side of the battery, this is the low side of the battery, point A is over here, nine volts lower than zero volts is negative nine. Part B, if you need some hints on that, remember that Ohm's law contains delta V. It tells you the potential difference across the resistor. Not the absolute potential, but the potential difference. So if you can figure out how many volts higher one end of the resistor is compared to the other, and then get the answer from that. So to summarize part B, and again, I'll write it down in a moment, but the basic idea is from Ohm's law, I times R would be, and I'm just picking all these numbers off the diagram, the current is labeled on the picture as half an amp, and the resistance of, that 40 ohm, of the resistor that's between points A and B, that's 40 ohms, I times R, <coughs> 0.5 times 40, you've got 20 volts between one end of that resistor and the other. If one end of the resistor is, well, I guess one other thing I need to mention is conventional positive current, which is what I labeled there with the arrows showing which way it goes. Conventional positive current flows from high to low potential. Just like, a, just like water flows from high to low elevation, current flows from high to low voltage. So B is on the upstream end. So that makes it the high end of the resistor. A is on the downstream end. That makes it the low end of the resistor. So you've got 20 volts across that thing. And if one end of it is at negative nine, which was our answer to part A, and if the other end is supposed to be 20 volts higher than that, that makes the potential at point B positive 11, okay? So I'll write all that out, but that's, that's how that works. So delta V, potential difference. And uh, I'll kind of repeat myself again. The mistake people like to make with this sort of thing is I'm supposed to calculate voltage. Voltage is equal to I times R. They multiply this out, and they write down that 20 volts is the answer. Okay? It's not V that equals I times R. If you want to get particular about the details of the notation, it's delta V, the difference in potential between one end of the resistor and the other. So so here's our resistor. And the current is flowing through it in that direction. B is there at point A. We already know the voltage at point A is negative nine volts. That was the answer to the previous part of the question. If the current was flowing in the other direction, you know, from the bottom of that picture toward the top, then what you'd have at point B would be negative 29, okay? But as it is, 
Point B is on the upstream side of the resistor. That makes it higher than point A. 20 volts above negative 9. is 11 volts. So that's that's the answer. That's the potential at point B. Well, slide the page up a little more. So I have defined volts and amps and ohms. The other thing that kind of fits into this conversation is watts. You know, you look at the end of the light bulb and it says 60 watts, 120 volts. A watt is actually something I talked about in Physics 121, for those of you who took that from me. And if you took it somewhere else, I'll bet they talked about it there too. A watt is a unit of power. And in the first course, I talked about it in connection with mechanics. Uh, the example I usually start out with is if you've got a friend who should sound familiar, hopefully, if you've got a friend who weighs the same thing that you do, and you're both standing at the bottom of a flight of stairs, your friend runs up the stairs, you walk up the stairs. By the time you get to the second floor, you've both done the same amount of work same amount of weight has been lifted to the same height, but your friend who ran up the stairs did that work more rapidly, that's more power, okay? Power is the rate that work is done, or equivalently, you could say the rate at which energy is delivered. As you go up the stairs, you're gaining potential energy, and the one who runs up is gaining potential energy more rapidly. So, Change in potential energy per unit time is the, the way I've written it there. Um, the SI unit for power is, as I already mentioned, a watt. Energy is measured in joules, time is measured in seconds. A watt is a joule per second. Uh, the uh, unit of power from traditional British units is a horsepower. Nobody rates light bulbs or space heaters in horsepower. Maybe occasionally an electric motor, I suppose, but um, anyhow, we'll stick with watts. Uh, discussion of electricity, it's pretty much gonna be watts. So from that basic definition, if it's physics 121 and you're covering mechanics, from that basic definition, you can make a couple of substitutions into it, manipulate it around, and power is equal to force times velocity, which was an equation that was kicking around last fall. If you're talking about some mechanical system moving at some velocity v, a truck going down the road or something. If you take the basic definition written there, change in energy per unit time, and you make some different substitutions into it and manipulate it around a little bit, you can show that power is equal to volts times amps, like it has in the lower left-hand corner there. A little more playing around with equations, you can, well, all you do is you substitute in Ohm's law. Delta V is equal to I times R, so if you put I times R where the delta V used to be, it becomes I squared times R. Or if you substitute from Ohm's law the other way around, it's d squared over r. So we've got three different formulas there you can use to calculate power or wattage, if you prefer to call it that. Which one you want depends on what information you have available. If you know, uh, if you know the amps and the ohms, you'd use i squared times r and so on. Problem number four actually has several parts to it, and uh, that'll take a few minutes. For anybody who uh, needs a little nudge getting started, if 
you're rolling right along, just ignore me, but I'm not gonna get into yet how to do each of those four things it asks for, but let's go over this much. <coughs> let's match up the numbers with the letters and also with what we asked for. So, the start of the question says this hair dryer is labeled 1200 watts. Now, if you don't quite remember what unit goes with what name, go to the last page of the formula sheet. There's that table of units back there, and you start going down the center column until you get to where it says watts, and you look next to that and it says power is measured in watts. And if you look around the formula part of the formula sheet, you'll see that we're representing power with the letter P. If you'd like me to point out where I'm getting that from, just ask. So P for power, 1200 watts. Mark 1200 watts, 120 volts. So this one doesn't usually give people too much trouble. Volts, we're using the letter V for that. And like it says, this means if you apply 120 volts, this thing will go through energy at the rate of 1200 joules per second. Now, if your house is like out on the end of the wire someplace where you're only getting 114 volts instead of 120, then your hair dryer is going to be giving you somewhat less than 1200 watts. Uh, but if it's run at the rated voltage, then this is the rate that it uses energy. And the other thing it tells you is uh, not right at the beginning, but somewhere down in part C, I guess, tells you how much time you run the hair dryer. And you know, you know, using the letter T for time, tells you that that's five minutes. As for what you're looking for, well again, you can, you can use the formula sheet to kind of match up the names to the symbols. So like, uh, in section three there, it says electric current, and then it says I equals Q over T. I'm telling you there that the letter I is the symbol I'm using for the electric current. Because that's what's right next to the term electric current. That's what it's written there. So part A, find out how much current it draws, is saying find I. find its resistance. Well, there on the formula sheet, it says R equals resistance, just to the right of Ohm's law. So part B, find R. Up at the very top of the page, when I first started talking about Coulomb's law, it said I was using the letter Q for charge. So how much charge flows through this resistor during the five minutes. That's asking you to solve for the letter Q. And how much electrical energy is converted into heat. This is the thing that determines how much this costs you because the, the electric company bills you for energy. PE for potential energy, um, as it, the, the heating elements in the hair dryer are resistors. There's also a motor in there, but the, the heater is what uses up most of the energy. Either way, through the, through the heating element or through the motor, electrical potential energy is converted into some other type. Um, it's converted into heat in the heater, it's converted into kinetic energy in the motor. But the, the amount of the, the change in the potential energy of the electrons flowing through this, this device, that's the amount of energy that it uses. So once you have all, 
all of that straightened out, you need to start looking around the formula sheet and, for example, to find I. What you're, what you're looking for is an equation that contains the letter I and everything else in the equation is on your list of things that you already know. And so that's, that's not only how to approach this problem, that's kind of how to approach a lot of different types of problems. Part A, power equals delta B times I, that rearranges to become I equals power over delta B. Power, like it says over there on the left, power is 1200 watts and the voltage is 120. And amps, which, by the way, is how I would approach problem number five when we get down to. There's actually a couple of ways of doing number five, but the way I did it anyhow is I figured out how many or how much of an amp each light bulb draws in doing it exactly this way here. And then the question becomes how many light bulbs, if each one draws that, you know. Oh, it comes out a little under half an amp. If each if each bulb draws that much current, how many bulbs can you have all together without going past 20 amps? But anyhow, keep going with this. Power. Well, one of the several formulas for power is power equals B squared over R. And so that would rearrange to become R equals V squared. Well, it's actually delta V. It's sloppy with my notation. Um, this is not, not the only way to do it. Some of you may have done part B with Ohm's law, and that's just as correct and just as easy. Since you know the current from part A, you can put that into delta V equals I times R and, and solve for R and it gives you the same answer. But doing it this way, 120 squared for the voltage squared, 1200 for that makes no sense the way I've written it at all. This is supposed to be a P. That looks a little better. And uh, push the buttons on your calculator. Or like I said, you get the same answer from Ohm's law. See, well, here again, there's more than one way of doing it. The way I did it was from the definition of electric current. Amp sequence. An amp equals a coulomb per second. I equals charge per unit time. Since how much charge flowed by Q is the thing that I'm trying to find, multiply both sides by T, drop in the numbers. 10 amps from part A for the current. There's usually somebody who forgets to convert minutes into seconds. Uh, 300 seconds. See, an, an ampere is a coulomb per second. Coulombs per second times minutes is not going to give you coulombs. So 
So 3,000 coulombs worth of charge flows through the hair dryer by the time your hair is dry. Finally, the amount of energy power. And again, there's other ways you could approach this. Uh, potential energy also appears in the definition for potential difference, delta U equals delta PE over Q. You could get it out of that also. But I went with uh, energy delivered per unit time is power. Work per unit time, if you'd rather say it that way. You do the algebra, and the energy used by the hair dryer is the power times the time. A watt is, by definition, a joule per second. Joules per second times seconds gives you joules. So 1,200 watts times the 300 seconds point six and the fifth joules. Or in the terminology the electric company would use one tenth of a kilowatt hour. Okay, this next thing about house wiring being in parallel is uh, just, well, it's a good thing to know, I suppose. Um, probably down in your basement, you've got your service entrance. The way it's normally done is you've actually got two hot wires coming in from the pole out in front of your house. It's actually alternating current. So I, I've labeled it here as if it was two steady voltages, plus 120 and minus 120. They're actually sine waves. So, and, and what the plus and minus is, is just simply that the, the current on one of those hot wires is 180 degrees out of phase with the other one. So when one wire has a positive voltage on it, the other wire has a negative voltage. And when the one that used to be cut used to be positive becomes negative, the one that used to be negative becomes positive. Maybe I should just draw a sketch. It's, uh, so you got, you've got voltage as a function of time. On the one wire, you've got something like that. And on the other wire, you've got something like that. That's what's really going on, but alternating currents are a topic for another day. So we'll just play a convenient little game of let's pretend. Uh, for many purposes, you can pretend that one of the hot wires is at plus 120 and the other one is at minus 120. Your ordinary household outlets and your light fixtures and all that would either go from one would go from either one of these hot wires to zero. On the other hand, the electric range, if you have one, electric oven, electric dryer, any of these types of appliances that need a higher voltage because they pull a lot of power, then they connect it from there to there uh, between the positive and negative 120s. And that's how you get the 240 volts for you know, for the electric dryer or whatever. But anyhow, um, and of course the, the neutral wire is grounded. Your, your breaker box has, a, 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 you know, it's connected to a, a stake in the ground. So the, on your three prong outlet, actually the, the, the ground wire there is redundant. It should be at the same potential as the neutral wire, uh, but 
um, well, safety is quite often about redundancy. That's why you take a spare tire when you go driving around. The one time I left off the spare tire, okay, I mean, you drive around for years and you don't need that spare tire. Well, I took the snow tires off and I put the summer tires on. And, and one of the summer tires is what we had in there for the spare. And when I put, put that on the, on the vehicle, I forgot to stick one of the snow tires back in there to be the, stair, the spare. Now, a few weeks later, my wife and some of the kids head down the throughway for Albany. And <laughs> somewhere this side of Utica, what do you know? One of the tires blows out or something. I wasn't there, which is part. I mean, my, this was like 20 years ago and my wife still talks about it. Oh, no problem, we'll just change the tire. And she looks underneath the minivan where the spare tire is supposed to be and there is no spare tire. And, that was a problem. But anyhow, the, uh, the neutral wire and the ground wire are redundant. They're both supposed to be at ground potential. But uh, as far as how this sets you up to do number five, this just points out that all of the things on a given circuit in your house are in parallel. So each of them gets the full 120 volts. As for the amps, how many amps pass through the circuit breaker is equal to how many amps goes through the toaster plus how many amps goes through the lamp plus how many amps goes through the fixture in your ceiling and so on. Uh, it says somewhere in your formula sheet that in a parallel circuit, I total equals I1 plus I2 plus I3. Whereas in a series circuit, it's equals instead of plus. So with that in mind for some background information, figure out how many of these bulbs could all be run on the same circuit if you had some reason you wanted to run dozens of lamps on the same circuit. 60 watt bulbs are a lot more common than 55 watt bulbs, but uh, I, liked, I liked the way the numbers worked out this way. So 55 is as good a number as 60 really. So the way I approached it anyhow, was to start out by how many amps goes through each bulb. Just like in part A of the previous question. Watts divided by volts equals amps. Well, it's probably good to be careful of round off errors. If you just called it point, I don't know if you get the same answer if you called that 0.46 of an amp, you might get away with that. But if you don't round anything off, that's what it is. Four, five, eight, and then a whole lot of threes. So then if that's how many amps goes through one bulb, what's the total number that you can run on this circuit? Well, the way I looked at it was to just treat it like canceling units. We've got, 20 amps is our maximum. How many light bulbs would you have if, if you were drawing a total of 20 amps? Well, of course, a light bulb isn't a unit in the same sense that a, a volt or a meter or something is, but just the same. You can look at it the same way. In my first step, I determined that one light bulb 
equals 0.458 of an amp. So amps times bulbs per amp multiplied by a factor where the numerator equals the denominator. Amps will cancel out and I'll be left with bulbs. 43.6, repeating three of them. And then the thing I like about these numbers is then I can kind of stand here and say, use a little common sense. First of all, normally, we round off to three significant figures in this course, but it's really hard to operate six tenths of a light bulb. Uh, some things come in whole numbers, and this is one of them. So the other point is, normally what you do is you round to the closest number, <clears throat> which in this case would mean rounded up to 44, but that's inappropriate because any more than this takes you past 20 amps and trips the breaker. The appropriate thing to do in this case is to truncate rather than to round. So even if it had come out 43.95, still need to go down to 43 and not up to 44. This is the maximum number of bulbs for which you are below 20 amps. And the last topic in section three, we're gonna spend a pretty good chunk of today's class on section four. Section three is a little on the short side, I guess, but In any class where I cover electricity, I like to spend a little time talking about electrical safety. Uh, what I usually say is that after you're done with this course, you may or may not ever need to know Ohm's law again, but unless your plan is to live in a cave and eat roots, berries, and squirrels for the rest of your life, you are going to be living around electricity and so it's probably good if you understand a little about what it can do to you. So one of the things it can do to you, of course, is burn down your house, which would be very unpleasant if you were in it at the time. Not actually that pleasant even if you weren't in it. Um, the issue, one of the issues there is that any time, as I've already explained earlier, Anytime electricity flows through a resistor, it creates heat, okay? By the process that I was talking about before, where the electrons are scattered off the surrounding metal atoms, the collisions make the metal atoms vibrate around harder, which is equivalent to a higher temperature. Well, to be precise, the rate that heat is generated in a resistor is equal to I squared times R, okay? It's the amps that create the heat. If you've got more electrons flowing through your resistor, they're gonna do, there, there's gonna be more of those collisions and it, it heats things up more. So it actually goes up rather steeply. Twice the amps makes four times as much heat. Three times the amps gives you nine times as much heat and so on. So, the wires in your walls have a certain amount of resistance to them. For many purposes, you can think of them as just, you know, lines of constant potential, but actually there's a fraction of an ohm per foot there. How much depends on the diameter of the wire. If you don't want the wires to get hot, there's a certain maximum for a given size wire. 12 gauge wire can safely handle 15 amps. Uh, no, wait a minute, 14, what did I say? 14 gauge wire 
can do 15 amps. 12 gauge wire can do 20 amps uh, and so on. Okay, Th those are the two sizes you typically find in household circuits because household circuits usually have a either a 15 amp or a 20 amp breaker on them. But the reason that the circuit breaker is there or if your house has been standing there for a while and still has a fuse box instead of a breaker box, fuses work just as well. It's just, uh, it's easier to cheat with a fuse. It's like, oh, this has given me some trouble. I'll put a 30 amp fuse in there. It's supposed to be a 15 amp circuit, you know, uh, or worse yet, you stick a penny in there. So, um, with, with, uh, with circuit breakers, you can't do any of that. You, you either have the, the right amount or it's tripped one or the other. But anyhow, that's, that's to protect the wires from overloading. Uh, the wires in your walls or the wires in some sort of device, you know, your vacuum cleaner or whatever. Uh, there are other ways you can start fires also. The first thing that comes to mind is loose connections. If the person who was installing your outlet there didn't get the screws tight enough, so that after a while there's a little bit of a gap between the wall. Yeah, it, it starts arcing. And that's, that's basically a little spark that's just waiting to find something combustible. So if, if you ever go playing around with the wires, you wanna be sure the screws are tight. But uh, electricity flowing through your body, okay? Aside from the fact electricity can burn your house down. If electricity flows through your actual body, that can do a couple of undesirable things. There are two distinct types of injury, one of which is burns. If you become part of a circuit, you are a resistor, okay? All of this stuff about I squared R and Ohm's law and all, everything I've been saying all afternoon here, that now applies to a part of your body. Heat is generated when current flows through a resistor. If it's enough heat, it'll burn you. Just the same as if you touched a hot frying pan or something, except instead of getting burned from the outside in, you're kind of getting burned from the inside out. But, you know, basically a burn is a burn. It hurts like the Dickens, but a couple of weeks later, you're okay. Um, unless it's a really severe burn. But 120 volt house current should not be able to burn you so severely that you die, okay? Now, the wires that are up on the poles along the side of the road, those are, you know, I don't know the, an exact number to tell you, but I'm pretty sure it's somewhere in the range of three to, th to 5,000 volts is what's up there. Uh, they step it down to bring it into your house for safety reasons. But you know, if there's a storm uh, and the wires come down, or if you're doing something stupid with a ladder, uh, you, can, you can get burned to death by the, those wires up there. But for, for ordinary house current, the main thing that you want to keep in mind is the second item on the list. Burns are unpleasant, but a burn from house current should not kill you. On the other hand, um, see, your, your nervous system in your body is basically electrical, well, electrochemical, I guess, is the right name for it. There really isn't a sharp line between electricity and chemistry in a lot of cases. But, uh, you know, if I decide to wiggle my finger, that's because a little electrical signal traveled along the nerve impulses originated in my brain and electricity makes muscles contract. I mean, I, I got a pretty good shock once where I couldn't let go of the wires. That's kind of unpleasant, actually. It's like, I'd really like to let go of this wire. Um, it's nice to have somebody around to pull the plug when, when that happens, but, uh, Electricity makes muscles contract, as in makes the muscles in your hand contract, 
and so you can't let go of the wire. Well, your heart is a muscle. It doesn't know it's supposed to beat, it's just a lump of meat, okay? And it's constantly receiving little electrical impulses that make it contract, and when it contract, it kind of squishes the blood on through the arteries, and that keeps you alive. Well, if an electrical current passes through that part of the body, and then this is part of the reason that alternating currents are, all else being equal, a little more dangerous than direct current, is because uh, AC has a natural rhythm to it that can kind of take over for the rhythm of your body. But anyhow, um, if you go, just, just like, enough of a shock to my hand can make me hang on to a wire I don't want to hang on to. If the same thing goes on in your chest, that can mess up the rhythm of your heart or stop it entirely. And uh, well, I wrote there the heart or the lungs. A shock can paralyze your lungs also, but it takes several minutes for you to smother. And if somebody turns off the current in the meantime, normal breathing usually returns again. Uh, you can stop your heart in seconds, maybe even a fraction of a second. I'm not sure exactly, but it's a very short amount of time. And normal rhythm does not automatically return when you turn the current off. You may need some paramedics to give you a zap and hope it works. So the, the most important thing, if you're around electricity, is to be conscious of creating any sort of a path through your chest area. Your brain is also rather sensitive to electricity, but your brain is off here in the periphery. You know, nobody sticks their head in a fuse box or a television set or something like that. But oh, somewhere down the list, it says, yeah, right here. If you're working on a live circuit, uh, an old saying is that you should keep one hand in your pocket. If it's, you know, you're, you're going to repair some sort of uh, electrical device, maybe a, a high-end television that's expensive enough, it's still worth fixing even today. So you, you take the back off it, and the first thing you see is a big sticker with red letters on it that says, be sure the device is unplugged before removing this panel. And of course, you look at it and you say, how am I supposed to check the voltages if I've got it unplugged? So you, you set the panel over there. And so you've, you've got the schematic and it says, well, you know, right here, it's supposed to be 62 volts. And right there, it's supposed to be 15 volts. And you've got your, you, you've used meters a couple times. There's two wires that come out of there. If you've got one wire in this hand and the other wire in that hand, well, let's see, yeah, that's 62 volts, just like it's supposed to be. And then you touch something you didn't mean to touch. You create a path that comes up this arm, passes through the chest, goes down the other arm to maybe you're touching the chassis of the, of the TV. That's at ground potential. So you, you, you've got a current flowing right through where your heart is. Whereas if you took one of the wires from that voltmeter and hooked it to ground with an alligator clip instead of holding it in your hand, now you're in there, or you know whatever you're doing, whether it's fixing a TV or doing something to the house wiring, and you're not completely sure that the circuit's turned off, or whatever, whatever you're doing, where there's some chance you might touch a live wire, if you're just poking around in there with one hand like this, you can still get a shock, but it'll just be a shock to your hand. So maybe you touch something at a high voltage and current flows across your hand and out the other side like that, your hand is a lot more rugged than your heart is, okay? It takes around maybe, it depends on how large an area it's spread over, but it might take around an amp to make a noticeable burn, a little charred spot or a blister or something like that. It's a small fraction of an amp. It's well down into the milliamps is all it takes to stop your heart. So if you're poking around in that TV like that, and all of a sudden, yell, and you yell a couple things that you hope the kids didn't hear, a minute or two later, you're in there checking your voltages again, whereas if you were doing it like this, 
they take you out on a stretcher with the blanket pulled over your head. Same number of amps, okay? So that's, that's the thing about keeping one hand in your pocket or you know, any other kind of path. If, if, if you're doing something in the fuse box in the basement, don't stand on a damp earth floor in your bare feet and then stick your hand in the fuse box. There again, that's a path through your chest. You need to isolate yourself from the rubber soled shoes ought to protect you well enough. Or if you really want to play it safe, you could stand on a cinder block or something like that. Electricity will not flow if it has nowhere to flow to. Now, house current is alternating current. You can get a little bit of a tickle off AC because your body has a certain amount of capacitance, which is a word I haven't, you know, actually I did define that already. Um, but uh, well, a little tickle never hurt anybody, uh, to, to a decent approximation anyhow. And it's, it's exactly true with direct current. Uh, current won't flow if there's nowhere, you know, it has to be complete path. If you've got a pipe, it's just capped off at the end, no water will flow through it, and a wire or somebody's body that leads nowhere. Well, a current won't flow through that either. So how much you're injured depends on the amount of current flowing through the body. I've already sort of alluded to that. Maybe an amp for a noticeable burn, um, a fraction of an amp to stop your heart. So if it's the amps that hurts you, why do I always talk about high voltages being, you know, the wires along the side of the road, very dangerous. Under the hood of your car, 12 volts, please. Nobody ever got electrocuted by 12 volts. Well, never say never, but uh, generally 12 volts is nothing to worry about. So. It's the amps that hurts you. Why do I talk about the bolts like that? Again, you are a resistor. You obey Ohm's law, which isn't written here anywhere, but uh, now it is. Twelve volts in your car, 120 volts in your house, ten times as many volts will put ten times as many amps through you. So what would be more or less harmless under the hood of the car can be a very dangerous shock when the voltage is 10 times higher because that pushes 10 times. And even more volts, the wires alongside of the road, even more amps through you. Of course, as a footnote to that, the resistance of your body is mostly in the skin. If, if you take one of my multimeters and grab a, you know, one wire in each hand and measure the resistance of your body, you'll get tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of ohms. Almost all of that is in the skin. The moist tissues inside of your body are only good for a few ohms. So if something unusual happened, like you get stabbed by a wire or something like that, then a voltage that would normally be harmless can in fact be quite dangerous. But, uh, precautions. Many devices are grounded. A wire that leads to a stake in the ground gives electric current some place to go that isn't through you is the plan, okay? Whereas the whole idea of safety around current or you know voltages and currents and things is you want your body to be not grounded because a, you know a path to ground, complete path for current to follow is a bad thing if it's through your body. It's a good thing if it's an alternative to going through your body. So it's good if your microwave is grounded, it's bad if your body is grounded. Um, I don't know how often this happens, but if you're ever around somebody who's actually being shocked, it's the same advice that they give when they're training lifeguards. The drowning person needs help, not company. You need to treat someone who's in contact with live wires as if they themselves are a live wire. 
So, you know, if you're standing on a damp dirt floor in your bare feet, don't grab that other person who's getting shocked. Um, find, you know, a stick or some insulating object and knock, well, if they're getting shocked out of some device you can unplug, just pull the plug. But if it's, you know, something hardwired in the walls that you can't do that, then knock their hands loose with a stick or, you know, a shoe or something like that that won't conduct electricity. And I timed that pretty well. It is exactly the center of the period. So we'll take our break here. I have a question. Okay, let me just pause there, actually stop. Um, 